Okay, let's pray for the service. Lord, I just want to uh, thank you for this this study, for this book that you've given us. Uh, we can trust it. We can um, trust our, our lives with it. The information that, that is in it is true. And we can rely on it. All the promises found in Christ, that, that's where they're found, in Christ. When we... When we become born again, we can just take those promises as, as our own. There's 365 promises in the Bible, one for every day. It's amazing. Thank you for that, Lord. So I just lift up the study today and that you would uh, be with us. I pray that you would speak to your people what you would have them to hear. Whatever it is, by your Spirit, that you would apply the Scriptures to their life and, and they would know that you were, you were speaking to them. So I just thank you for that. I ask that you would fill me afresh with your spirit, that I'd be able to articulate these things. And I pray for uh, the people that are here, that you would bless them for coming, and you would help them to be able to focus in, laying the things aside, the, the troubles of this life. Just lay them aside and just hear what you have to say to them today. So we pray that in Jesus' name. Amen. I titled uh, this message today, Adam Loves Eve. I thought it was kind of cute. That's why I did the picture on the, the bulletin of a tree with a heart and Adam plus Eve carved in it. Because that's what we're talking about today. That's what's exciting and, and just fun about going through the Bible. You don't have to do a topical message. The Bible's going to do it for you. As you just go through the scriptures, the Bible's going to touch on everything that needs to be touched on. And so I don't have to pick and choose because if I do that, then I'm going to pick and choose the areas that I like, you know, and that's all you're going to get. And so here we are, just naturally, we come to Genesis chapter 2, verse 4 through 25. My wife, Hall, was um, nine months pregnant with our son, Isaac, five years ago. And she was in actual labor for 10 days and I mean they were the regular labor and but and she was doing it this was our first child you know and uh, we did everything we could you know we had a doula and we were going to do a natural birth and all this stuff you know and she's going for nine months pregnant she's going for walks you know trying to get this baby to to come and uh, he just wouldn't come. And we didn't know it at the time, but she was too small and he was too big. And he wasn't going to come, no matter what she did. But she was trying, not knowing, and uh, went to the doctor, you know, and he said, yeah, you're, you're five centimeters dilated. You're in labor, so let's make an appointment, you know. And we did, and it was a couple days, you know, when he was available because we wanted him to do it. There was a series of three doctors, but he was the best one, and he was her doctor. And, and so we scheduled it in a couple days. And that last couple days, and she didn't sleep, you know, and it was miserable for her. And she was full term, 42 months or whatever it is. Um, bear with me, you know, I'm a guy talking about this. It's like a girl talking about construction. It doesn't work very well. <clears throat> so we go to the hospital. And she's in, you know, labor, and they give her pitocin, which is to strengthen the contractions. And they wait a little bit, and then they max her out on pitocin. And I mean, max her out on it. And so now she's having contractions, nonstop, continual, no break, full-on contractions. And she had an allergic reaction to the pitocin. And so she's having trouble breathing and coughing, you know, because she's having an allergic reaction to it. So this goes on for and and uh, for like 12 hours, full on labor, um, maxed out. Um, you know, the bathtub and the hospital and all this stuff. And she's in, in incredible pain, and I'm there with her, and I can't do anything. I'm like helpless. And I'm praying, and the nurse is there, and and they're watching me, and I'm praying out loud, God, you know, please help her, you know. And I'm helping her go to the bathroom and, and walk and do all this stuff. And, and 
you know, it, amongst it all, it's a witness to the staff. You know, they made comments to Holly afterwards. She said, we've never seen a husband do all that. You know? And, um, you know, God got the glory because they knew why. Because I, I was a Christian. You know? I was praying for her. I was fighting for her. She's not the type of person that fights, you know. And so I was fighting for her. And the doctor came in and, and he's like, okay, you know, we're going to break your water because it's not breaking, you know. Because the baby wouldn't go far enough down to break the water in the canal. And so he broke the water. And, and after you break the water, you have to deliver the baby within 24 hours. Well, this is like, you know, almost a full day into this thing. And she's already been in labor for 10 days, you know. So she's exhausted. And now she has to push, you know. So after she went full dilation and, you know, fully ready to have the, the baby, now it's, it's time to push. And, yeah, right, you know. But she does for three hours. And he's like, that baby's not coming. You know, we, we need to take you into surgery. And um, by this time, man, she is just, she is so exhausted. And now they're finally going to give her an epidural. She hadn't had any medication, you know, we're trying to go natural and everything for the baby. And so now finally the, the anesthesiologist comes in. But you have to lay, you have to sit still like this over a chair so they can put that in your back and put the tube in there. And you have to do that for five minutes. But she's contracting continually without stopping because of the Pitocin. She can't hold still. So I'm like, great, you know, and there's risk of, of injury, you know, permanent injury sticking a needle in your back. And so I'm praying, and right there in front of the anesthesiologist and nurses, and she stops contracting for five minutes. And he does the procedure. Amazing. He does the procedure, but the tube he didn't insert it all the way in. So she only got the initial injection of the epidural. So two and a half hours later, she's back in to full-on pain and contractions and can't stand it and already exhausted. I mean, she was getting... So this is at nighttime, 3 in the morning, and I'm calling the nurse in and, well, you know, the anesthesiologist is at home and, and I'm just, I'm like freaking out because it's like, he didn't do it right the first time. The tube came out, you know, so she wasn't getting the drip. So then he has to come and do it again. And they're like, well, we're going to wait until... And I'm like, no, he needs to get here now, you know. And so I'm fighting for her, and they call him, and he comes. And again, full-on contractions, no breaks. you got to wait for five minutes. I pray again. They stop. She gets the procedure. This time he does it right. By this time, you know, we're all exhausted. I'm exhausted, and I just... She's going into surgery, and I just... I break down, you know, I just start bawling. Because it's, it's a, a, a big surgery, you know, it's a major surgery, that's the word I'm looking for. And uh, even during the surgery, um, her blood pressure, which was low to begin with, it went down to 30, you know, and the doctors were, were scared at that point. So I get to come in after they have her opened up, I get to come in behind the curtain, and I'm there, you know, I could see the incision, and. And, and everything, and she's behind this this curtain, so she can't see it, but she can feel it, you know. Although she's numb, and uh, I'm singing with her, you know, uh, a cappella, you know, songs, you know. Um, again, in front of all the doctors and everything, and we're praying, and I'm comforting her, and we have the baby, and everything's fine. But all that to say, this. Even though on that day I was so protective of her, so loving, so comforting, and there by her side taking care of her, all that gets taken away by an outburst in anger, by a show of lack of compassion, by showing signs of loss of control, you know, by... Uh, unspit words coming out of my mouth it all just gets taken away like that and that's what happens and that's
kind of what I wanted to talk about today in, in discussing the marriage relationship. So in the study today, we're going to be looking at Adam and Eve and the relationship between a man and a woman. It's where we're at today. It's not an easy subject to teach on because I fall in this area, you know. Remember, Paul says in Romans, he says, Do you not teach yourself? Do you teach your, do you not instruct yourself? Yeah, you do. And when you go through these things, I mean, the Holy Spirit just nails you. How about you, Tim? It's amazing when you have children and you raise children and you instruct them, you know, they're doing something wrong and you're, you're getting on their case and, and it's like, are you doing this, Tim? You're instructing them, are you doing this? And he just nails you, you know, because I just did what I'm telling them not to do, you know. Watch what you say. Be slow, you know, to anger, you know, slow to speak. Obedience, you know. So last Sunday, we saw how God created the heavens and the earth. We left off with God creating man, Adam and Eve, in his own image. God saw that what he created was very good. So here we are, day six. Everything he created is very good. Day one, it is good. Day two, it is good. Day three, it is good. Day six, it is very good. Everything is very good at this point. And so, again, chapter two goes back into the creation account. And some people have a problem with that. But remember how the Hebrew language goes, right? We looked at it. You have a simple past tense. Verse 1, chapter 1, verse 1. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Simple past tense. Then verse 2, we have this parenthetical statement. Oh, by the way, let me draw your attention, your focus in on the earth. The earth at this point in the creation is void. It's without form and it's void at this point in the creation story. Then he begins to go in verse 3, chapter 1, verse 3, a sequential tense. You know, then this happened, then I did this, then this. And now, we're coming into chapter 2, and he's going to go back, and you might say that chapter 1, it's looking at it through a wide-angle lens. And now, the Lord is going to zoom in to help us get a little bit more detail into the creation account. And specifically, chapter 6. So this is a, a zoom lens zooming in. And so we're re-talking about creation. So let's start with verse 4. We left off at chapter 2. Genesis chapter 2, verse 4. If you're having trouble finding Genesis, it's in the front of the book. Mm -hmm. We'll go down to verse 9. Verse 4 says, These are the generations. And remember that, that word in Greek, generations, that's where we get the word uh, Genesis from. Of the heavens and the earth. These are the generations of the heavens and the earth when they were created. In the day that the Lord God made the earth and the heavens. See, this is significant because this is the first place in Scripture where the word Yahweh is given. It's Yahweh Elohim, Lord God. So, Lord, all caps, all capital letters. Anytime you see that in the Bible, it's that covenant name, Yahweh, that God gave to Moses. So, here's the first place you see it. Right here. So, on, number one on your outline, Genesis 2-4 is the first place we find Yahweh, Y-H-W-H, or LORD, all caps, in the Bible. And number two on your outline, it says this is significant because the Creator 
is also the covenant maker. of the rest of the Bible. Israel would know that her Lord had created everything and had formed mankind for a special reason, for a special design, not just by chance. We didn't just come up out of the swamp and there's no design to us. We were created for purpose. Verse 5 says, When no bush of the field was yet in the land, and no small plant of the field yet sprung up for the Lord, God had not caused it to rain on the land, and there was no man to work the ground. So in, in the garden at this point, on the earth at this point, it didn't rain. There was a different system of watering. A mist came up, and it watered the earth that way. But he says, no bush had, had come up yet. No plant. Verse 6 says, and a mist was going up from the land and was watering the whole face of the ground. Then, verse 7, the Lord God formed the man of dust from the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. And the man became a living creature. So, the work of the Lord in creating human life involved fashioning from dust and the inbreathing of life. Remember, we looked at before how God spoke into existence the creation, but with man, he got down and he scooped up the dust and he formed man out of the dust and then he breathed life into him. That's very important. God gets physically involved in forming Adam, or man. The word formed, yasar, describes the work of an artist. Describes the work of an artist. In Hebrew, that's what the word means. And like a potter shaping an earthen vessel from clay, you can picture this potter shaping this vessel on this little spinning wheel. You get that picture of God creating this, this work of art. So too was Adam made from clay. We, we're 90% water and, and we have all 17 elements that make up the dirt. We have the same. I think there's 17. Whatever this... I think there is, but maybe there's 13, but I... Forgive me if I'm wrong on that. Now the word Adam stands for man. So the word for ground, Adama, is related. As the first man received the breath of life from God and became a living being, so too we, when we become born again, we receive the breath of life, the Holy Spirit. Remember what Jesus said to the disciples? John 20, verse 22, on the right side of your outline. It said, when, when He had said this, He breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. <clears throat> See, there's the, the beginning of a new thing. In the Old Testament, the Holy Spirit would come upon someone, but it could leave. Now, after Christ died on the cross and rose again from the dead, now there's a new thing going on. Now we're indwelt with the Holy Spirit permanently, sealed for the day of redemption. It doesn't leave you now. You're sealed for the day of redemption. If you're truly born again. Right? But again, some people go to church and they get a little bit of the Holy Spirit on them. And they might get emotional, you know, but remember, I used that picture of that ball of clay. You have this ball of clay. And it's a blue ball of clay. And that's us. And the Holy Spirit, you might liken to a, a, a red ball of clay. And so we come to church and, and we get a little bit of the Holy Spirit. You know, we're in the church and God's speaking and we're getting touched and we're getting emotional. We get a little bit of the red clay on our exterior. But when you're born again, when you, by faith, receive 
that Jesus is the Son of God and that He died on the cross for your sins. And you receive that by faith and you confess, you know, you, you, you realize you're a sinner and that you need a Savior. And then you receive that in faith. Then, the Holy Spirit comes into you and so now your little blue ball of clay that's you is now mixed with the red ball of clay and it becomes a purple ball of clay. Okay? Not just little red spots on it, but a purple ball of clay. And now you can't get one out of the other. right? So that's what happens. That's what needs to happen. We need to be born again by receiving the in-breathing again of the Holy Spirit by the Lord Jesus. Verse 8, And the Lord God planted a garden in Eden, in the east, and there He put the man whom He had formed. So God's a, a gardener, and He plants this garden. In verse 9, Out of the ground the Lord God made to spring up every tree that is pleasant to the sight and good for food. The tree of life was in the midst of the garden, and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil was there also. So you get this picture of God creates this garden. He puts man in there and then he causes right in front of man the garden to sprout up. That's what the language says. The tree of life was there and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Much as is the case today. Today we have the tree of life that stands before us. What might that be? It's the cross of Christ. There's our tree of life. It's the cross. And we have the knowledge of good and evil. That's the world and the world system and everything that's in it. And I wonder what tree most people eat from. The tree of the knowledge of good and evil, right? Because that's the tree that's beautiful. That's what's appealing to us. That's what draws us and gets our attention. And you know, it has to be that way. It has to be appealing. God allows it to be attractive because to follow Christ requires a choice. Love requires a choice. We're not robots. He doesn't want a bunch of robots. I love you, God. I love you, God. No. He wants you to choose to follow Him and love Him. He doesn't force it on you. Remember, forced love is rape. It's not love. It's rape. And God doesn't force Himself on you. He gently taps on your heart and He says, I love you. I died for you. Receive Receive life. Come to me. All who are heavy laden and burdened, come to me and I'll give you life. That's our Lord. So which tree do we desire? Of course the one that's pleasing to the eye, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Isaiah 53, verse 2b, second on your outline reference scriptures, talking about Christ in the Old Testament, Isaiah 53, says, um, skipping down to part B of the verse, it says, He had no form or majesty that we should look at Him, and no beauty that we should desire Him. You see? But the world and the world system and sin is very attractive. It's very appealing. It's very drawing. So now, in verse 10, God tells us a little bit about the landscape. And we'll just kind of read through it. Verse 10. It says, A river flowed out of Eden to water the garden. And there it divided and became four rivers. The name of the first is the Pishon. It is the one that flowed around the whole land of Havilah, where there is gold. And the gold of that land is good. Delium and onk stone are there. 
The name of the second river is the Gihon. It is the one that flowed around the whole land of Cush. And the name of the third river is the Tigris, which flows east of Assyria. And the fourth river is the Euphrates. It says in verse 15, it says, The Lord God took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to work it and keep it. Now remember, before the flood, the landscape was different. And are these the same rivers that we have today, the Tigris and the Euphrates? Probably not. Probably just a reusing of the name and so on. It, it, it would seem like it is because there's Assyria and, and everything, but the, the world went into an upheaval during that flood, as we'll see when we watch a video on Wednesday. Uh, the Psalms says that the fountains of the deep broke open, you know, and this water gushed up from underneath. And mountains rose up and valleys, and uh, it, it was just a, a, you know, look at the Grand Canyon. Look at how that was formed. Not millions of years, but a very short period of time because of the flood. And we have an example of that in when Mount St. Helens erupted, you had a mini um, Grand Canyon that took place in a very short period of time. And it's a perfect picture of what happened, what can happen with a lot of water in a very short period of time. So we're going to look at those things on Wednesday. If you'd like to come and, and really get these things underneath you, this foundation of there's evidence for it and it's overwhelming. Now, verse 15 says, The Lord God took the man and put him in the garden uh, to work it and keep it. This is different than chapter 3 after the fall. See, this was Adam's service to the Lord, much like we talked about downstairs, our, our service to the Lord. You know, It's not to be done in, in toil, in, in sweat. You know, The priests were to wear a garment that, that they wouldn't sweat in. It wasn't supposed to be a burdensome service to the Lord. And so here uh, is the case. Unlike after the fall, it's by the sweat of your brow and thorns and thistles and, and so on. That's the curse. Verse 16, And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, You may surely eat, here's the commandment, You may surely eat of every tree of the garden, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat. For in the day that you eat of it, you surely will die. You shall surely die. So man is put in charge over creation. And he's commanded. This is the first commandment in the Bible. To enjoy all the trees, especially the, the tree of life that I've placed before you. But of this one tree... The tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you shall not eat. In the day you do, you surely die. Now, he didn't say, I'll kill you the day you eat of it, right? I don't tell my son Isaac, hey, if you go out and play in the street, I'm going to kill you. That's not what the Lord said here. I say, Isaac, if you foolishly go out into the street and try and play out there, in the day that you do that, you'll surely die. Because there's cars out there. Now, I didn't say I'm going to kill you. But in the day that you do it, so basically you're killing yourself as they By disobey God. God. God just warned them of the consequence of disobedience. This was the test. And you get a picture of this... Um, <coughs> these two trees in the middle of the garden kind of close proximity to one another that brings about this this temp, you know this um, this test now by disobeying god the act itself would bring about the knowledge of good and evil at this point they didn't know what evil was they only know, knew the goodness of god god walked with them you know, in the cool of the day. Lord, what's this? And yet Adam was hyper-intelligent, as we're going to see in, in the next verses. Let's look at that, verse 18. 
This is important. This is a very important verse right here. Then the Lord God said, Then Yahweh Elohim said, It is not good that man should be alone. I will make him a helper fit for him, or suitable for him. Or I will make him a helpmate suitable for him. See, this is the key verse that we need to understand. It's not good for man to be alone. God's first created being, God says, it's not good for man to be alone. Then he says, I, God, will make him a helper, fit for him. Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians 7, 7, and really, you need to go back to verse 6 and read it to down to verse 9. I'll do that real quick for you on your outline. Paul says, Now, as a concession, not a command, I say this. I wish that all were as myself am. Single. In this context, Paul is single now. He was married. <clears throat> but each has his own gift from God. One of one kind and one of another. To the unmarried and the widows, I say that it is good for them to remain single as I am. See, Paul tells us right there. But if they cannot exercise self-control, they should marry. For it is better to marry than to burn with passion. Matthew chapter 19 follows along the same thing. He says, there are... There are eunuchs who have been made so from birth. There are eunuchs who have been made eunuchs by other men. And there are eunuchs who have made themselves eunuchs for the sake of the kingdom of heaven. Let the one who is able to receive this receive it. I remember back when I uh, came back to the church, we dedicated my life, and uh, I wanted a wife. I wanted a godly woman in my life. But it wasn't happening, and I saw my wife Holly, who I have now, and I was praying for her for like a year and a half. But it wasn't happening. Because God was preparing. I wasn't ready yet. I still had a lot of the world in me, you know, that he was getting out of me. And plus he was growing me up as a Christian, because she was at this level in her Christian walk, and I was down here. And the two, you know, were, were to be evenly yoked. Just because two people are a Christian doesn't necessarily mean you're evenly yoked, right? Because you, you need to be on this, you know. And really the man needs to be, because the man's supposed to be the spiritual leader, right? How can the man be a spiritual leader if his wife's up here? And we're going to find out through this study that the woman, typically, her nature is to be spiritual. That's why Satan came to her in the garden. Because, as you can see, the churches are typically filled with women because they want to be close to God. They want they have a natural need to be spiritual. <clears throat> so, remember, I'm going to make him a helpmate, fit for him, suitable for him. So remember this as we continue on. Verse 19, Now out of the ground the Lord God had formed every beast of the field and every bird of the heavens, and brought them to the man, to Adam, to see what he would call them. This is still day six. Now whether it was all the animals in the whole world at this time, or just those that he brought in the garden, you know, we don't know. But we know he named birds and, and uh, beasts of the field and, and so on. And whatever the man called every living creature, that was its name. The man gave names to all livestock, to the birds of the heavens, and to every beast of the field. But for Adam, there was not found a helper fit for him. So, in verse 18, God makes this, The Lord said, It is not good for man to be alone. I will make a helper fit for him. And now, he brings this reality to life. 
as he parades these animals in front of Adam, male and female, and he gave Adam the ability to see the creature and its, its appearance and its nature and give it a name that fit it. When you look at the Hebrew language, the names have meanings to them. Like Isaac or Itzhak means laughter. Why? Because when God told Abraham, Sarah, your wife of 80 years old, is going to have a baby, she laughed in the other room. So his name was Isaac, which means laughter. In much the same way, we named our son Isaac because we, I thought we were going to have a girl. And we go in there and do the little sonogram or ultrasound, that's what it is. And it was a little boy, so we laughed, you know, and we named him Isaac. So on the sixth day, God brings the animals, male and female, for Adam to name. And what he does is, Adam realizes there were two of every kind. And he's looking around and he's like, okay, there's two of every kind. Right? He's missing something. And so the statement came to life, it's not good for man to be alone. It hit home with Adam that day, that sixth day. So in verse 21 it says, So the Lord God caused the deep sleep to fall upon the man. If only God could do that today and cause a deep sleep to fall upon men until he brings their wife to them. Right? And while he slept, God took one of his ribs and closed up its place with flesh. And the rib that God, that the Lord God had taken from the man, he made into a woman and brought her to the man. So again, in this verse lays, lies a truth and an insight that we need to look at and understand. This is still the sixth day. Remember back in Genesis chapter 1, 26 and 27, God said, let us make man in our image, and he made them male and female. So this is still the sixth day. However that works out, it's still the sixth day. Also, we see that God removes something from man. He put Adam to sleep, he opens up the side, and he removes something. What did he remove? Whatever he removed, he gave to the woman. Because he fashioned her out of it. So we lost something, and they got something. Right? That's very important. Very important. To realize that. We have something they don't have, and they have something we don't have any longer. And we need it. Because God made us with it at the beginning. And then He took it out of us. And actually the word in Hebrew is He built the woman. He built the woman. Now there's another Hebrew word for rib. So maybe um, it's not co quite correct uh, translation that it's a rib. But nonetheless it doesn't matter there is something to note here he didn't take something out of his head so the woman would rule over him and he didn't take something out of his feet so man would stomp on her or walk on her he took something out of his side closest to his heart right so they would walk together in unity All you have to do is look at a woman and you can see what was taken from man. Compassion. Sensitivity. That natural loving care. We don't have that, typically. We're leathery. I mean, we can love and we can show compassion and sensitivity. Usually it's learned because we have a mother that has those qualities and she passes it on to us. And so it's important that it's not taken away from the mother, see? And a lot of women, it's been taken away from them when they were growing up. 
it got robbed from them, stolen from them through abuse or, or some tragic incident that happened in their life and it got stolen from them. Or maybe their parents, and some parents, you know, this happens a lot in, in the farming community, it's, it's better to have a boy, right? And so the women are raised as boys. And it's kind of looked down on to be a girl, you know, because it hinders you. But you know what? God made us, made us different. He made you that way. Does that mean a girl can't ride a horse? No. My wife throws a, a ball like me, and she catches it, and she hits it. And it's, I'm amazed by that. Most girls can't do that. But she was raised as a boy. She was raised in that mentality that being a girl kind of hinders you, you know. And so part of that was stolen from her, you know. So men are able to show love and compassion and tender care, but it's usually because they were taught by mothers with these qualities. An example of that would be, uh, you know, Dick Owenby. He's like that. Very sensitive, kind, caring nature. When he was up here at the business meeting, I mean, he started crying for me and my family. You know, touched my heart. <clears throat> but still a man. You know, still a man's man. So therefore, if it's lacking, it probably means that it was lacking in the mother or something happened uh, in the mother during her life that was stolen away and, and then passed on and so on. Peter says in 1 Peter 3, verse 7, on your outline, now he's talking to the husbands. He just in, instructed uh, the wives and, and basically the church before the wives and, and submission and things like that. And then he instructs the, 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 uh, the wives. And then now he says, he dials in on the husbands. And he says, Likewise, husbands, live with your wives in an understanding way, showing honor to the woman as the weaker vessel, not spiritually, physically, as the weaker vessel, since they are heirs with you of the grace of life, so that your prayers may not be hindered. What? If I mis mistreat my wife, my prayers are going to be hindered? Yeah. If I'm not living with my wife in an understanding way, my prayers are going to be hindered? You bet. It tells us right here. Many times in Scripture, the Bible tells the husband, love your wives. It doesn't tell the wives that. It tells the wives to respect your husband. But the husband, love your wives. So, if I say, and I have said it, that's why this is hard. It's like, ouch. You're just being emotional. Or, you're just insecure from your past. I said that. I'm not loving my wife in an understanding way. I'm hindered. I'm hindered in my walk with the Lord and my prayers. I'm hindered. Because it was taken out of me and it was given to her for a reason. The two shall become one. See, I need her. I need her to be complete because I'm lacking in what she has. And she needs me to be complete because she's lacking in what I have. And typically man, men have stability and strength and determination. Not that women don't have those qualities. But women, women you know, a little bit more emotional, a little bit more unstable sometimes, you know, nesters. I mean, we're, we're opposites, right? I want the house just the way we put it, okay? But a month later, the woman wants to change everything. She'd come home and it's like, where's the dishes? They should be right here next to the dishwasher. And the coffee cup should, you know. My mom would always do that. Come home and I'm like, everything's different. Why did you change it? It works. Don't fix it. It's not broken. But we're different. We say up, they say down. We say, you know, I'm hot. She says, I'm cold. Okay? We're different. We're made that way. But husbands, live with your wives in an understanding way. 
Ephesians 5.25 Husbands, love your wives again as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. Are we giving ourselves up for our spouse? For our significant other? Or are we belittling them, cutting them down when we don't understand or relate to what they're going through? I've done this. I do this. It's not easy. It's not easy. You know? But we need to do it. We're commanded to do it. I'm lacking what woman has, and so often I can't relate to what she's feeling. But I need to. I expect her to spend the time and listen to my babble and my construction talk and my hunting things and I need to do the same thing and listen to her and what she's feeling and going through and just sit there and listen and give her a hug and tell her I love her. You know. And when I don't, I'm sinning against God because God commands me to do so. Many places in the Bible, again, God commands us to love our wives. Again, Colossians 3.19 on your outline says, Husbands, love your wives and do not be harsh with them. You see, the wrath of man does not bring about the righteousness of God. And I can be way more harsh, way more hurting than my wife can. I'm tough. I'm made differently. I'm on the job site, we get mad and we talk and then, you know, we shake it off and we shake hands and, you know, everything's fine. But women are a little more emotional. So our words hurt them much deeper, much more long, long much longer than we intended it to, to happen. And then we can't understand what's going on. Well, it's because you did this and you said this. And it, it goes deep because they're made differently, you know. They're sensitive. And we're more callous. Women were made to be our helpmate in order to complete us because God took from us and built them with what He took. This makes us complete in marriage. In marriage. And it makes them complete. When we, after time, begin to slack in our love and understanding for our wives or our girlfriends, we might become excuse me, our girlfriends who might become our wives. We change the way we treat them from how we treated them at the beginning. I believe what applies to us is what applies to the church in Ephesus. Pastor Brian told my wife Holly, he said, Holly, you don't have to worry, because Tim, I know his character. I know he's not just messing with you. He's going to hold your hand, he's going to open your door, he's going to tell you he loves you and take care of you all of your life together. He's not going to stop after you get married. A lot of men stop after they get married. He said, Holly, you don't have to worry about Tim. He's not going to do that. And I haven't. Not because he said that. Now, I believe God would say to us in much the same way that what he said to the church in Ephesus. And why can I pull this out of Scripture over here, out of context and Revelation, and apply it to us husbands right now today? Because Paul says we are a picture of Christ and the church. Our marriage is a picture of Christ and the church. And so here it is. This is what Revelation 2.4 says. Leading up to this verse, he's, a comment, you know, he's uh, commending them for their work in the church and what they're doing. He says, you did this and you did this and this is great. But I have this against you. That you have abandoned the love you had at first. Remember therefore from where you have fallen. Repent 
and do the works you did at first. Is it so hard to tell someone you love them? Is it so hard to hold their hand? Is it so hard to send them a text or a phone call or bring home flowers one day? Send them a text and say, Hey, I'm just thinking about you. I love you. you know? Is it so hard to do these things? No, it's not. Especially in my case with my wife because she is insecure because of how she was raised in her family. She is insecure. And so, do I make her more insecure by withholding those things from her? Or do I give it to her naturally because she deserves it and, and she needs it and, and help her to be more secure? Right? I either hinder or I help. My job as her husband is to help as the head of the household. Do what you did at first. He who finds a wife finds a good thing. Regardless of all the stuff that goes with it. Because they're dealing with our stuff too, aren't they? We have a lot of stuff, a lot of baggage that we bring to the relationship. So do they. But we complete each other. And through the relationship we learn how to work those things out. Quit looking for the exit. Look for a solution. You know, work these things out. And you know what? It, it's, it's hard because a lot of the ball falls into the court of the man. It's, typically it's my responsibility to go to her first and say, I'm sorry, honey. Regardless if she says anything, which she usually does. But she needs that. Because I'm strong. I'm, I'm, you know, I'm domineering. I'm uh, masculine. And if I come to her, it, it breaks down the, the wall that's up. And I say, honey, I'm sorry. I blew it. I was wrong. Please forgive me. And she can tell if I'm sincere about it by my voice and my heart that comes across. And then immediately she says, I'm sorry too, honey. You know? But sadly, I mean, it's just the way it is. There's a lot of things, responsibilities in the man's court. I mean, the women have their stuff, right? We, we each have our stuff. So why all this attention on man? Well, we'll find out in chapter 3 next Sunday. But until then, let's finish um, this chapter. Verse 23. Then the man said, This at last is bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. Verse 24. Therefore a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife, or, or cleave to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. Now the key there is, if we don't leave father and mother, we can't cleave to our wife. If I'm constantly running to my parents for advice or support or complaining about my wife to them, then it actually sways their opinion against her because they naturally are going to you know, tend to be on my side more than, than hers just because I'm, I'm their son. And, and vice versa, if she does that and, and, and it creates this conflict, we're, we're to leave and cleave to our wife and let her fulfill that role. Not my mom. Right? And if something else is taking my attention away from my wife, then I'm robbing her of something. You know, if this is more important than spending time with her, I'm robbing her of something. You know, and then I'm less likely to not care too much about her or what she's going through or want to be there for her because now this is more important over here. Verse 25, it says, And the man and his wife were both naked and they were not ashamed. See, they didn't know evil. They didn't know right from wrong. How husbands can emotionally meet their wives' needs. For a Christian, a husband needs to be the spiritual leader of the home. There's got to be that desire for 
spiritual leadership. That means you have to come to church. You have to read your Bible. You have to be able to answer the questions that your wife has. You know? And when you do that, she's going to see that you're walking with the Lord. That's going to be attractive to her. It's going to be comforting. And um, there, there's a sense of security because she knows you're listening to the Lord. You're following the Lord. You know? And then it's easier for her to come underneath, come next to, because what? I'm going to make him a helpmate. Right? I'm going to make him a helpmate. And women who have not fulfilled that role as helpmate and have gone and sought after their own lives and their own careers and their own, they're always at the end of that life a little empty. You know, women, some of the most wealthiest women in the, uh, people in the world are women. You know, they can achieve just as much, if not more, than a man can achieve, you know. But is that why they were created? You know, does that mean a woman can't have a career in a marriage? No, of course not. But the primary role right here was to be a helpmate. My wife went down to seminary with me and... and uh, she kind of went down there and felt like, okay, this is Tim's calling. I'm supporting him, but it, it's his calling. And then she gets down there, and Pastor Chuck's wife, Mrs. K. Smith, she was like, you're called. If, if you're called to be his, hus your, his wife in marriage, and he's called later on to be a pastor, you're called to be his pastor's wife, to be his helpmate in the ministry. And it was a wake-up for her, you know. It was like, yeah, we're both called. That's why she had such a desire to serve in the children's ministry, to worship, you know, to come alongside and compliment me in my calling. And she says, Tim, there's no greater fulfillment in realizing that role as your wife, and that's how God made me, you know. There's no greater fulfillment in that. The, mass, uh, the, the vast majority of wives are starving for verbal affirmation from their husbands. And most men are so thoughtless and insensitive, not every man, that they will not give their wives what the wives desperately, desperately want and deserve. We husbands gladly encourage our wives to buy food and grudgingly encourage them to buy clothes. But most who come to counseling just cannot dig deep enough to give complimentary words. So marriages are failing, wives feel unappreciated, and marriages wither and die. So we as husbands, we need to speak up. God expects you as the head to provide for her emotional well-being. Whisper it. Write it. Shout it. Just get those words of affirmation to the ears of your wife. Those of you who do this and are doing it, let this message be confirmation to you and encourage you, you know, that you're doing the right thing. Okay? Let's pray. Lord, thank you uh, just for the message that you gave me and I pray that you would use it even to those listening online uh, that listen to these sermons and I just pray that you would bless it and that you have instructed us today as men you've instructed me Lord and I'm learning and I just pray by your spirit that you would help me help us men to do that to love our wives to do what we did at the beginning and to live with them in an understanding way. So thank you, Lord, and I pray for your people. In Jesus' name.